Sometimes a bunch of people get together and something happens. I mean, if you survived Network 7, then you were kind of you were kind of prepared for pretty much anything in broadcasting. Network 7 was, was an important part of that path towards what we have now. People either loved it or hated it. There was no TV the way there is now. There was only three channels. And then when Channel 4 came along, it was like, you know, a breath of fresh air. Everybody, everybody went, wow. Well, Channel 4 just opened up the whole independent world. And what that independent world was able to do was actually look out and think, what are young people like? What do, what do they do? I mean, we were living in uh, Thatcher's Britain. Uh, most young people were completely unengaged in politics. And I thought part of the blame lay with the media, kind of talking down to people. Um, especially the younger people who felt, I guess, that there was nothing in this for me. And they just switched off in droves. So I wanted to make programmes that were going to engage young people and bring them back into thinking about, you know, serious uh, issues. And maybe not so serious issues, but, you know, sort of engage in stuff other than just pop music and fashion and, and the kind of stuff that, that you know, youth programmes did. When Network 7 came along, it was challenging that whole uh, idea that young people never wanted to watch, uh, you know, news or uh, whatever. And anyway, probably because it was really uh, boringly presented. Network Seven has come to the northeast to investigate a new and disturbing trend that is sweeping through the old pick communities in the region. If, if Network Seven hadn't happened, probably something else would have happened like it. So the late eighties, I think you've got a different kind of sort of slightly more hungry, media-savvy youth audience coming from not just the sort of Oxbridge kind of elite, but coming from, you know, working class, sort of you know, across the classes. It was for those youth people, it's for those youth types. Yeah, that'll keep them busy. Yeah, 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 because we have to, we've got remits, so we have to do things for those people, whatever they are, youth. You've done it again, haven't you? I mean, do you think there's anybody in the world who can stop it? No. <laughs> I think Janet and uh, Jane, who were behind the programme, um, they, they saw it as a, an opportunity to rewrite the rules of how television is done. Why should everything you know, count down to ten at the end and end in a, in a nice, slick way? Uh, I mean, I, I, because people can understand it better is the easy answer, but it worked okay. Oh, Janet was definitely there. The heart of it, you wouldn't cross her. There was Janet Street Porter, who was the sort of eternal youth. I, I think we lived in uh, in mortal fear of uh, of the two dragons. I found her quite scary. She called me and said to me, "I want a f***ing BAFTA." I thought I was going for a researcher's job. That's what was advertised, um, and ended up on the first show, basically holding together two hours of outside broadcasts and three films and God knows what else. So I reckon I had a nervous breakdown live on air about, you know, once every two weeks. So um, actually what happened was that it came across as uh, attitude. A roundabout way of saying, come over here and I'll smack your face. So the title that? sequence was put together by Matt Forrest. Uh, we supplied him with the logo. They already had the logo. The Malcolm guy did the logo. Uh, so we just had to get to that um, somehow. And he moved him around without asking, which I thought was a bit rude, but that's fine. You know, we go up there and see where it's coming from. It's all like space junk. But it's like, um, you know, we've chucked everything out there that we don't need in the world, you know? Like, forget recycling, just chuck it into space because we're all full up here. Some people just went, what a load of shit, walked away. And that's fine, as long as you react, you know? They say something's a load of shit. It's almost a compliment. A strand called true or false. The idea behind them was that um, every week you'd have a story that the audience uh, had to try and judge whether it was true or false. Sort of slightly kind of free for all world. Suddenly there was this little sort of five to ten minute crafted little documentary thing. I think uh, the shock tactics work best when uh, I remember watching one program stage a gay marriage. Um, and it was done on set. And um, right at the end, all the cameras are, are you know, in close on the happy young couple, and they just went for a proper big, you know, tongues down throat, 
uh, you know, gay kiss. All the cameras were on, on this in massive close-up. So you could almost hear the panic in the gallery where they were going, cut to camera two. Oh my God, no, cut to camera three. And I was just chortling. Uh, I was watching it at home. I think largely because Janet was full of this idea that the young people who were spending the time uh, playing arcade games, uh, very fast paced, lots of information to take in all at once. She decided that they could take in lots of information all at once so that if you had an interview, you would have information running along the bottom or flashing up. If the story said 57% of young people haven't got somewhere good to live, then the requirement would be a massive great graphic that said 57%. I mean, you know, when, when the camera got bored uh, while we were doing uh, a feature on set, it would just wander away. Um, so Janet would yell from the, the gallery downstairs in Limehouse Studios and just say, all right, drift off. And while I was talking, Suddenly, I noticed the camera had gone. So basically, that was it. That was the end of the story. Production offices and the, stu the live studio were the same former banana warehouse on the Isle of Dogs. It was a banana warehouse with lots of sawn up caravans and bits of, um, I don't know, agricultural machinery or whatever it was. Um, and um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. My memory of the production two series was the constant background noise was these water pumps outside going ka -chunga, ka -chunga, ka -chunga, ka -chunga, draining the, these huge holes that would be later become the Docklands Towers. Fun fair, have a ride in the dodgems, eat some fish and chips, yeah, play a bit of crazy cop. You cannot give the gay fish and chips. Felt it, from what I saw, it seemed to be much more sort of tabloidy than, uh, than uh, what we were doing on the first series. I remember there being some, some bizarre stunt at the end of the second series in which they were going to bring aliens through the roof. It was absurd. I mean, it had become, it had become quite, you know, sort of a self-parody by then. Novelty is the tag they put on things like Network 7. Mm -hmm. Novelty. It's a novelty. No, it's a scream. It's a loud scream. But stop doing that to us. We're not stupid, you know? We've got the same brain as you've got. We've got the same brain as the people who control the box, you know? Talk to us like intelligent people, please. The biggest story in today's papers involves this woman, Victoria Calder Smith, ex girlfriend of Falklands officer Robert Lawrence. Robert, as you may. Highly unlikely that something as speculative as Network 7 would be uh, commissioned. I mean, you could argue that, okay, it's already happened and it was successful back then, uh, so why shouldn't it be successful again? Um, so maybe someone just needs to, um, needs to be brave. Have we progressed? Look at morning TV. No, not one bit. It's the same junk. I don't think young people are being badly served in terms of entertainment, but they might be being badly served in terms of content that tells them something, challenges the, the norm. And putting it simply, you know, we live in an age where uh, there is constant gratification.